Hello everyone and welcome to Intermediate Accounting. We're going to start right in with Chapter 1, The Environment and Theoretical Structure of Financial Accounting. We're going to understand why financial accounting provides useful information for decision making in the process by which accounting standards get produced and also the conceptual framework that underlies the financial accounting. So the perspective you're going to gain in this chapter will help you um, link as a foundation for a greater study of financial statements and the way statement elements get measured and then the concepts that underline the measurements along with various disclosures. Think of accounting as a special language that companies like Target and Walmart use to communicate financial information that help people inside the company and outside of the company to help make decisions. Now the Pathways Commission of the American Accounting Association developed an illustration that helps visualize this importance of the role of accounting. Shown on this slide, you see that accounting provides useful information about economic activity that helps produce good decisions and foster, fosters a um, healthy society. Economic activity gets very detailed and involved, and decisions have real consequences. So critical thinking and many judgments are needed to produce the most useful accounting information possible. The primary focus of financial accounting is on the financial information provided by profit-oriented companies to their present and potential investors and creditors. Now, one external user group, often referred to as financial intermediaries, include financial analysts, stockbrokers, mutual fund managers, and credit rating organizations. These users provide advice to investors and creditors, and they make investment credit decisions on their behalf. Investors and creditors use a lot of different kinds of information before supplying capital to businesses. They may learn about a company's products or its management, and then consider its competitors in the health of the economy more generally. Financial information is a key component of gaining information for their decision making. The primary means of conveying information to investors, creditors, and other external users is through financial statements and those related disclosure notes that we will talk about. Financial statements most frequently are provided, they include the balance sheet, also called the statement of financial position. I like to refer to it as a snapshot in time because it's just a picture at a moment in time. Another financial statement is the income statement, or we can call it the statement of operations, along with a statement of comprehensive income. Then we have a statement of cash flows, and finally the statement of stockholders' equity. This entire process of providing the financial information to external users is what we call financial reporting. This slide shows you the financial information providers and external user groups. In this slide, we see the different providers of financial information and the different external user groups to which they provide that various types of information. In the United States, we have a pretty developed free enterprise economy with the majority of productive resources privately owned rather than government owned. So it helps our economy operate efficiently. Now these resources should be allocated to private enterprises that are going to use them best 
to provide the goods and services desired by society and not to enterprisers that are going to waste those resources. The me mechanisms that foster the efficient allocation of resources are the capital markets. We can think of the capital market simply as a composite of all investors and creditors. Business, various businesses go to the capital market to get the cash they need to function. Now, three primary forms of business organizations include sole proprietorships, and they also include the um, partnerships and corporations. Now, in the United States, the sole proprietorships and partnerships outnumber corporations, but the dominant form of business organization in terms of, uh, in terms of ownership of productive resources, of course, is the corporation. Investors provide resources, which is generally cash, to corporations in exchange for an ownership interest, which is shares of stock. Creditors lend cash to corporations either by making individual loans or by purchasing publicly traded debt, such as bonds. Stocks and bonds are traded on organized security markets like the New York Stock Exchange or NASDAQ. I'm sure you've heard of one of those. New cash is provided by initial market transactions in which the corporation sells shares of stock or bonds to individuals or other entities that want to invest in it. So like when Target went public back in 1967, it was selling shares to finance its expansion. Then subsequent transfers of those stock and bonds between investors and creditors then are referred to as secondary market transactions. The corporations themselves do not receive any new cash from those secondary market transactions, but the secondary market transactions are important to the efficient allocation of resources in our economy since these transactions help establish market prices for additional shares or for bonds that corporations may wish to issue in the future to acquire additional capital. Also, many investors and creditors might be unwilling to buy stocks and bonds if they thought they couldn't eventually sell those securities to others in the future. Investors and creditors are willing to provide capital to a corporation by buying stocks or bonds only if they expect to receive a return on their investment. They want to receive more cash from the corporation at some future date then they give the corporation, and that only makes sense. They should receive some benefit from investing in a company. A corporation's shareholders will receive cash from their investment through the ultimate sale of the ownership shares of stock. Also, many corporations distribute cash to their shareholders in the form of dividends. When deciding whether to purchase or retain an investment in a company, Shareholder, shareholders are going to weigh the rate of return that, that they're going to receive against the uncertainty or what we call risk that will, realize, will be realized on that return. Now remember, the greater the risk, generally, you're going to have a greater reward. The smaller the risk, then you're going to have a smaller reward. A rate of return is a measure of a profit as a percent of investment. So rate of return is the income you collect on an investment that gets expressed as a percentage of the investment's purchase price. With a common stock, the rate of return is the dividend yield or your annual dividend that you receive divided by the price you paid for the stock. However, the term is also used to mean percentage return, which is a stock's total return, dividend plus change in value, divided by the investment amount. If only 
it were that simple, but rates of return often involve incorporating other factors like bites that inflation and taxes take out of profits or the length of time that's involved and additional capital an investor would make in a company. If the investment's foreign, then you've got to look at exchange rates that affect the rate of return. So in this example, the investor initially invest $10,000 and then later sells this investment for $10,600, which means that the investment appreciated by $600. Bucks. In addition, the investor, investor received $400 in dividends that were declared while they own these shares. So the rate of return gets calculated by dividing the sum of the dividends and the share price increase which we call appreciation, by the initial investment. So this particular case, we have $400 in dividends and $600 in appreciation. That's 1000 bucks. We divide 1000 bucks divided by the $10,000 initial investment, which means we have a rate of return of 10%. Now, if all else is equal, investors and creditors would like to invest in stocks and bonds that provide the highest expected rate of return if all is equal, but of course all else isn't always equal. Let's look at a question here. Creature purchased $200,000 worth of Truman stock, received four quarterly dividends of $1,000 each, and sold the Truman stock for $206,000 after one year. So what would be Creature's rate of return? So we know they had quarterly dividends of 1000 each, which is $4,000 annually. Then after one year, they, the um, stock appreciated $6,000 because we bought it for $200,000. We sold it for two hundred six. dollars So in total, $10,000 is the amount that they have received in profit. If you divide that by the purchase price of 200,000, that is how you'll find out your rate of return. So I'm gonna give you a minute so you can think this one through. Hopefully you answered C. 5%. So if you take the 10,000, divide that by 200,000, you're going to get a 5% rate of return. Now, all else equal, <laughs> investors and creditors would like to invest in stocks and bonds that provide the highest expected rate of return, but there are a lot of variables to consider before you make investment decisions, like the risk that expected the expected return is important. So to understand this, let's consider the following two investment options. So one is invest $10,000 in a savings account insured by the U.S. government. That's going to generate a 5% rate of return. Or, number two would be to invest $10,000 in a profit-oriented company. Now, while the rate of return from option one is known with total certainty, the return from option two is uncertain. The amount and timing of the cash to be received in the future from option two isn't going to be known. Now, the company in option two will be able to provide investors with a return only if the company's going to generate a profit. So it's got to be able to use the resources that's provided by the investors and creditors to generate cash receipts from selling a product or service that exceed the cash disbursements necessary to provide that product or service. In other words, the revenue minus the expenses have to have a positive number here. So potential investors require information about the company that will help them estimate the potential for future profits, as well as return they can expect on their investment and the risk that's associated with it. If the potential return is high enough, investors will prefer 
to invest in the profit-oriented company, even if that return has more risk associated with it. So in summary, the primary objective of financial accounting is to provide investors and creditors with information that's going to help them make decisions. That information should help investors and creditors evaluate amounts, timing, and risk or uncertainty of the enterprise future cash receipts and disbursements. The better this information is, the more efficient will be the investor and creditor resource allocation decisions. But financial accounting doesn't only benefit companies and their investors and creditors. By providing key information to capital market participants, financial accounting also plays a vital role that helps direct society's resources to the companies that will utilize those resources more effectively. Next, we're going to talk about the cash basis of accounting versus the accrual basis of accounting. Now, we know cash basis of accounting produces a measure that we call net operating cash flows. This measures the difference between the cash receipts and the cash payments from transactions related to providing goods and services to customers during a reporting period, generally a year or sometimes we show them monthly or quarterly. Over the life of a company, net operating cash flows definitely is the measure of concern because over short periods of time, operating cash flows may not be indicative of the company's long run cash rate generating ability. Sometimes a company pays or receives cash in one period that relates to the performance in multiple periods. So like, for example, in one period, a company receives cash that may relate to a prior period sales, or it makes advance payments or for costs related to future periods. Accrual basis of accounting doesn't focus on cash flows. It, it reflects other resources provided and consumed by operations during a period. So this accrual accounting model measures resources provided by business operations called revenues and the measures of resources sacrificed to produce those revenues are called expenses and it's the difference between those revenues and expenses which we call net income hopefully not net loss but it would be a net loss if our expenses are greater than our revenues so here we're going to look at an example. As you see, the prepayment of rent is only shown in year one. There's no charge against net operating cash flows in years two and three due to rent because the entire amount of the cash was paid in year one. Now, an accrual basis of accounting, notice that even though the rent was paid in year one, there is a charge against net income in years two and three because of rent expense. One third of the rent prepayment is a rent expense each year under accrual accounting. While this looks simplistic, it allows us to see the motivation for using the accrual basis of accounting. Accrual income attempts to measure the resource inflows and outflows generated by operations during the reporting period, which might not correspond to cash inflows and outflows. Does this mean that the information about cash flows from operating activities is not useful? Oh, it's very useful. Indeed, one of the basic financial statements, which we're going to talk about, called the Statement of Cash Flows, reports that information about cash flows from operating, investing, and financing activities, and it provides information to investors and creditors. Focusing on accrual accounting along with cash flows provides a more complete view of a company and its operations.
Let's take another multiple choice. Which of the following is not an advantage of accrual accounting? A spreads out the influence of one-time events that affect multiple reporting periods. B highlights cash effects on operations. C captures long-run performance. D recognizes assets and liabilities associated with receivables and payables. Take a moment and think about this one. Remember we talked at that accrual accounting really focuses on the revenues as they are earned and the expenses as they are incurred. So the one um, of these items that is not an advantage is B, the cash basis accounting focuses on cash in and cash out. And so that doesn't work with accrual accounting. This highlights the cash effects of ongoing operations. Accrual accounting is the financial reporting model used by most profit-oriented companies and by many not-for-profit companies. The fact that companies use the same model is important to investors and creditors because it allows them to compare financial information among various companies. So to help facilitate these comparisons, the financial accounting sec sector employs a body of standards, standards, and they're known as GAAP, or Generally Accepted Accounting Principles. GAAP is a dynamic set of broad and also specific guidelines companies need to follow when measuring and reporting information in their financial statements and in their related disclosures. The more important concepts underlining GAAP are discussed in another chapter in this book, and we're going to continue to bring it up over and over again. In this scenario, this helps us to understand the hierarchy of accounting standard setting in order of authority. So basically, Congress, we elect Congress. Congress then has created the Security and Exchange Commission, and they um, have the authority to create guidelines. They have given the authority to the private sector and currently the Financial Accounting Standards Board has been given the authority to make these financial decisions that companies are required to utilize. So I don't want to go into a ton of detail but know that back when the stock market was crashing, they felt like people were um, falsely presenting financial statements. So the Securities Act of 33 and 34 were trying or were created to restore some confidence in the community and the public. So the 33 Act set forth accounting. Um, requirements and disclosure requirements for initial offerings of securities. Remember those primary offerings. And then the 34 Act um, was created to provide requirements for the secondary market transactions and also it mandated reporting requirements um, for companies that were being traded on a publicly stock exchange. This 34 Act also created the Securities and Exchange Commission, which basically had the authority to set accounting and reporting standards for companies. Know that there was a change throughout the years. Initially, the Committee on Accounting Procedure was the um, in the body of uh, private, the, in the private sector that created the um, guidelines. And then from there, it switched 
over to the APB, the Accounting Principals Board, and since that time, FASB was created back in 1973, and there are basically in FASB seven full-time members. They represent various constituencies throughout the United States, and they really work on having an inclusion of various representatives from various sectors that come together and help create the regulations. That's pretty much all I'm going to say. Apart from GASB is the non or the government's uh, equivalent of FASB that create the standards for governmental entities such as states and cities. So another question for you, the accounting standards in the United States are currently set by FASB, the AICPA, the EITF, or the NCAA. Hopefully you've got that right. Since 1973, we've had the Financial Accounting Standards Board as the primary uh, body that helps create the laws of um, guidelines in accounting. So now we're going to talk about codification. Present day GAAP includes a lot of guidance. FASB's developed a conceptual framework that is not authoritative GAAP but provides an underlying structure for the development of accounting standards. Now the FASB also has issued many accounting standards that we generally call accounting standard updates, ASUs, and previously called Statement of Financial Accounting Standards, as well as many FASB interpretations and technical bulletins and EITF issue consensuses. SEC has also issued various important pronouncements. Determining the appropriate accounting treatment for a particular event or transaction might require an accountant to research several of these sources. So to simplify the task of researching an accounting topic, back in 2009, FASB implemented its FASB Accounting Standards Codification. This basically integrates and organizes all kinds of relevant accounting pronouncements. So when FASB issues a new ASU, it becomes authoritative when it gets entered into the codification. And it's organized into nine main topics and a lot about 90 subtopics. So as you can see, it gets complicated. Um, throughout the book, we're going to use accounting standard codification system in footnotes when we reference generally accepted accounting principles. Each footnote also includes a reference to the original accounting standard that then is codified into the ASC. This provides you with an understanding of the accounting standards codification topics. So we have the general principles and then from there the presentation of financial statements. We then go to assets liabilities, equities, revenues, expenses, broad transactions, and then the last one is in the industry. Most industrialized countries have organizations responsible for determining accounting and reporting standards. In some countries, like the United Kingdom, the responsible organization is a private sector body to the, similar to FASB, in the United States, and then in other countries, the organization's a governmental body. Now, these different organizations often produce different accounting standards, which really made it hard for accounting when you had a multinational company. And it was hard to compare between companies because companies are using different standards. And it really makes it hard for companies to raise capital in international markets when there is no one set standard. So because of all these different complications that arose, the International Accounting Standards Committee 
was formed in 1973 to develop global accounting standards. Now, the IASC reorganized itself back in 2001 and created a new body called the International Accounting Standards Board, IASB. The International Accounting Standards Board, their main objective is to develop a single set of quality, understandable, and enforceable global accounting standards that help participate participants throughout the world in capital markets and other users make economic decisions. The IASC has issued 41 international accounting standards and the IASB, the most recent bodies, endorsed these standards when it was formed back in 2001. Now since then the IASB has revised many of the IASs and has issued new standards on its own called IFRS, IFRS, International Financial Reporting Standards. Now this slide shows a comparison of organizations of United States and international standard setters. We see the way international standard setting is structured is similar in many ways to the standard setting structured in the United States. IFRS has been around since 2001. More and more countries are utilizing standards on IFRS and by 2016, about 120 jurisdictions require or use IFRS or a variant of IFRS for their accounting standards. Should the U.S. also adopt IFRS? Many argue that a single set of global standards will improve comparability of financial reporting and help facilitate access to capital. But others argue that U.S. standards should be customized to fit the stringent legal and regulatory requirements of the United States environment. There's also a concern that differences in implementation and enforcement from country to country will make accounting under IFRS appear more uniform and comparable than actually is the case. Another argument is that competition between alternative standard setting regimes is healthy and can help lead to improved standards. FASB and IASB have been working many years to try to get to one global set of accounting standards. Back in 2002, they signed what we call the Norwalk Agreement, pledging to remove existing differences in their standards. Then in 2007, the SEC signaled its view that IFRS are high quality by trying to eliminate the requirement for foreign companies that issue stocks in the United States to include in their financial statements a reconciliation of IFRS to U.S. GAAP. As a result, many foreign companies now have access to U.S. capital markets with IFRS-based financial statements. And then in 2008, the two bodies agreed to accelerate the convergence process and focus on a key on a subset of these a project. Already converged standards that we're going to talk about later deal with like revenue recognition, earnings per share, share-based compensation, inventory costs, and what we'll talk about is how we calculate fair value. So we're in the process. We haven't gotten real far. Back in November of 2008, the SEC issued a roadmap that listed some conditions called milestones that have to be achieved before the United States will shift to requiring use of IFRS 
by public companies. Then in 2011, the SEC issued two studies comparing U.S. GAAP and IFRS and tried to analyze how IFRS can be applied globally. These studies showed the, that the SEC identified some key differences and notes that the GAAP, U.S. GAAP provides much more guidance about particular transactions or industries and the SEC um, showed some notes uh, regarding the diversity in the application of IFRS, which showed there could be some problems with comparability of financial statements. Then in 2012, the SEC issued the final staff report, which basically said it's not feasible for the United States to just adopt IFRS. Given that a need for the United States, we need to have strong influence on the standard setting process and ensure that standards meet U.S. needs. Another issue related to the high costs of companies to convert to IFRS. And then the last was many laws, regulations, and private contracts reference U.S. GAAP. So as a result, we are still in limbo. The FASB goes through a process when developing accounting standards. So it is challenging because they have to understand the various economic transactions at which the standard would address and the various people that are involved in um, needing input in addressing those standards. This particular slide shows the FASB's process. They help FASB acquire information to determine the preferred method of accounting, but as a practical matter, this information also gathers, um, ex it, it exposes the FASB to a lot of political pressure by all these interest groups who want accounting treatment that serves their best interests. The FASB concept statement indicate that standards should present information in a neutral manner rather than being designed for a particular group. Sometimes politics, as we know, always gets in the way of the standard setting process. A change in accounting standards can result in a substantial redistribution of wealth within our economy. So it's not a lot of surprise that they've had to deal with a lot of political pressure over some of controversial accounting standards. One example of the effect of politics on standard setting occurred back in the mid-90s with respect to accounting for employee stock options. The accounting standards in place typically didn't recognize compensation expense if a company paid their employees with stock options rather than cash. Yet the company was sacrificing something of value to compensate its employees. The FASB postponed that companies recognize compensation expense in an amount equal to the fair value of the options with some of the expense recognized in each of the periods in which the employee earned the options. Many companies, a lot of high-tech companies, had been compensating employees with stock options. They applied a lot of pressure politically against this proposal and eventually FASB backed down and required only disclosure of options related compensation expense in the notes to the financial statements. Now it's been a, 10 years later, this issue has resurfaced in a more amendable political climate and FASB issued a standard requiring expense recognition as ori originally proposed. Another example of the political process and standard settings, the controversy surrounding the implementation of the fair value accounting standard that was issued back in 2007. Many financial assets and liabilities are reported at fair value in the balance sheet 
and many types of fair value changes are included in net income. Many have argued that fair values were estimates in a manner that exacerbated the financial crisis of 2008 and 2009 by forcing financial institutions to take a larger than necessary write down of financial assets in the illiquid markets that were going on at that time. So we'll talk about um, these various standards, but in this particular case, there's a lot of pressure that influenced FASB to provide its guidance on recognizing investment losses in situations of fair value. And ongoing pressure remains to reduce the extent to which fair value changes are included in the determination of net income. You can read through this slide here. And I will move on to the next one. So it is the responsibility of management to apply GAAP appropriately. Auditors, which is another group in the accounting field, serve as independent intermediaries to help ensure that management has appropriately applied GAAP in preparing the company's financial statements. Auditors, what we call audit or examine financial statements, to express a professional, independent opinion about whether the statements fairly present the company's financial position, its results of operations, and its cash flows in compliance with generally accepted accounting principles. Audits add credibility to the financial statements since they're from an outside source that, is re that are reviewing them or examining them they help increase the confidence of those who rely on the information. So auditors are really important in the capital markets because they help create security. In most states, only individuals licensed as CPAs can represent that the financial statements have been audited in accordance with generally accepted auditing standards. Now the dramatic collapse of Enron back in 2001. I don't know if many of you remember that, but it was the beginning of changes in the accounting uh, standards. And basically the dismantling of the international public accounting firm of Arthur Anderson, who was the auditor of Enron, this did a severe uh, upset to the U.S. capital markets. The credibility of the accounting profession as well as corporate America all were called into question. There was so much outrage over the accounting standards, scandals at big companies, WorldCom, Xerox, Merck, Adelphia Communications, so many that it increased the pressure on lawmakers to pass measures that could assist in restoring credibility um, and investor confidence. So driven by these pressures, Congress um, created the Public Company Accounting Reform and Investor Protection Act of 2002, which we know, know now as Sarbanes-Oxley Act, or we call it SOX. The Sarbanes-Oxley Act is talked about in pretty much every accounting course you take. Some of the key provisions regard creating an oversight board, which is the P Public Company Accounting Oversight Board, PCAOB. It has the authority to establish standards dealing with auditing, quality control, ethics, independence, and other activities related to the preparation of audit reports. Um, prior to the Act, the AICPA set the auditing standards and the SEC has the oversight and enforcement authority. Corporate executive accountability, they must personally certify the financial statements and company disclosures and if they screw up they're going to have severe financial penalties personally and the possibility of imprisonment. 
Now, does this accountability, has it changed the behavior of many individuals? No, it hasn't. Non-audit services, SOX makes it unlawful for the auditors of public companies to perform a variety of non-audit services for audit clients. So prohibited services include bookkeeping, internal audit outsourcing, appraisal or evaluation services, and other types of consulting services. Retention of work papers. Auditors of public companies must retain all audit or review work papers for seven years. And then auditor rotation, lead audit partners are required to rotate every five years. Conflicts of interest audit firms are not allowed to audit public companies whose chief executive executives worked for the audit firm and participated in that company's audit during the preceding year. In hiring of auditors, audit firms are hired by the audit committee of the board of directors of the company. They are not hired by the company's management. And then lastly, section 404 of the act requires that the company's manage must uh, document, the company's management has to document the effectiveness of all internal control processes that could affect financial accounting. The accounting scandals at Enron and at the other companies involved managers using elaborately structured transactions to try to circumvent specific rules and accounting standards. So consequence of those scandals was a rekindled debate over principle-based or more recently objective-oriented versus rule-based accounting. Regardless of whether accounting bases uh, standards are based more on rules or on objectives, prior research highlighted there's some potential for abuse either by structuring transactions around certain rules or interpreting underlying principles in a way that benefits them. So the key is whether management's dedicated to having a high quality financial reporting. Looks like bad ethics, values on the part of the management are at the heart of all these abuses and scandals. So now, as always is the case, we have to start talking about ethics and professionalism, and I'll do that in the next segment, um, part two of the series.